Hey everybody, welcome to the Aspirin Synthesis Lab. Here's the outline for this video. I'll be going over the reaction and going through the procedure. Then I'll show the experiment in the lab. And at the end, I'll take a look at the NMR to discuss leaning and show what that looks like. This reaction will actually be done in two steps. The first step will be taking methyl salicylate, also known as wintergreen oil, and forming salicylic acid. And in the second step, we'll be taking that salicylic acid and forming aspirin. In the first step, methyl salicylate will be refluxed with some aqueous sodium hydroxide, which will substitute the ester with the carboxylic acid group through a tetrahedral intermediate. And then it'll be worked up under acidic conditions to fully form the salicylic acid product. The reaction will be done in a sand bath and we'll let it reflux for about 15 minutes. Then the solution will be transferred to a beaker and the hydrochloric acid added until the solution is acidic. As the product forms, it is under basic conditions, so the carboxylic acid group will be deprotonated and will remain dissolved in the aqueous solution. But as we add the hydrochloric acid, the salicylic acid product will be neutralized and will precipitate out of solution as a white slurry. Then that crude product can be gathered through vacuum filtration and recrystallized in water. Now it's not incredibly soluble in water, so we'll probably have to use a lot more water than we're used to using like more than 10 milliliters. So we'll end up doing it in a beaker instead of a Craig tube or a test tube. Then those pure crystals can be gathered through vacuum filtration and we'll want them to be thoroughly dry before moving on to the second reaction. So we'll leave it on the Hirsch funnel for quite a while or even put the product into the oven to make sure that there's no water left over. We'll also characterize the salicylic acid to make sure that we did actually form it and we'll do that by taking the melting point and running an IR spec. Once we know that we for sure have salicylic acid, we'll then react it with acetic anhydride using phosphoric acid as the catalyst. And again, the salicylic acid must be dry from the previous reaction and the previous steps because water can actually hydrolyze the ester on the aspirin product. So in this second reaction, if we have water in there with additional heat, or it's allowed to interact with the aspirin for a prolonged amount of time, it can react with the ester and hydrolyze it back into the salicylic acid reagent. This reaction will be done in a hot water bath to monitor the temperature, which we'll want between 50 and 60 degrees Celsius, and we'll let that go for about 15 minutes as well. After which, we'll add some cold water, which will react with any excess acetic anhydride that would be left over. We'll let the product precipitate out of solution in an ice bath and then collect the crude product through vacuum filtration, recrystallizing it afterwards in ethanol. This time, before beginning the recrystallization process, I'll actually set aside 10 milligrams of some of the crude aspirin just in case I need some seed crystals and to show how much the recrystallization process does purify the product and affect its melting point. Finally, the aspirin can be characterized by taking its melting point and running an IR spec. All right, I'll start by getting 25% sodium hydroxide for the first reaction, and I'll add three milliliters into the round bottom flask, which also has a spin bar inside. So I'll have to heat up the sand bath to get that to dissolve. I'll put on the water condenser now and start heating up the sand. And it'll take some time to get hot enough, but once the solution starts refluxing, the methyl salicylate will begin to dissolve into that solution. And once it's completely dissolved, we can begin the 15 minute reaction. Once the 15 minutes has passed, I'll take the apparatus off of the heat to let it cool. And while it's cooling, I'll loosen the joint between the condenser and the flask to make sure that it doesn't freeze. The solution can now be transferred to a 20 milliliter beaker and placed in an ice bath where I'll be adding the acid. And I'll be using three molar hydrochloric acid, adding it until the solution is acidic. You can start to see some of the product precipitating out of solution as the acid is added, but I wanna keep going until the product no longer redissolves in the aqueous solution. 
At this point, I can now test the pH, and I'm looking for a pink color on the pH strip, so we're good to move on now. I'll pass the solution through the Hirsch funnel to separate it from the salicylic acid, and I'll rinse the beaker a couple of times with some cold water to remove as much product as possible. Then rinse the spin bar and the crude product in the funnel with some more cold water, stirring it while I do so. I'll leave the product on the funnel for a little bit to allow it to dry really well, and then transfer it to a beaker where I'll recrystallize it in water. And it's gonna take quite a bit of water to dissolve it, so I'll just keep adding water and heating it up until that product, the salicylic acid, is fully dissolved. And it actually took enough where I had to put it into a bigger beaker so it could contain all the water, but it looks like it finally got there. I'll let it cool down a little bit before placing it into an ice bath, just so the glass beaker doesn't crack or break. But once it's cool enough, I'll put it in the ice bath and wait for the salicylic acid to fully recrystallize out of the solution. After about 20 minutes, it looks like the salicylic acid is completely done recrystallizing, so now I can run it through the Hirsch funnel once again. And I ended up using so much water in the recrystallization process that I actually had to empty the filter flask once before I could run all the contents of the beaker through the funnel. Then I'll rinse the beaker a couple of times with some cold water, also rinsing the spin bar and the crystallized salicylic acid on top of the funnel as well. Here's where we want it to be really dry before moving on to the second reaction, so I'll leave it on the funnel for a while to make sure that as much water is filtered through as possible. I'll weigh out an empty watch glass, transferring the product onto that watch glass, but before I place it back onto the scale, I'm going to put it into the oven for a few minutes just to make sure that there really is no water left over, and then I can weigh out the full watch glass to calculate the percent yield for salicylic acid. Now I can measure its melting point, and although the solid started shrinking, I didn't see the first sign of liquid droplets until 159.2 degrees Celsius, and it looked like it finished melting around 160.1 degrees Celsius. And then I can run an IR spec using the neutral mole technique, And that turned out really well. We can see the carboxylic acid funnel with the additional OH peak around 3200 for the alcohol, the carbonyl peak around 1660, as well as some carbon oxygen stretches around 1250. Plus, I don't see any water contamination, so we're ready to move on to the second reaction to form aspirin now. To start, I'm gonna want at least 200 milligrams of salicylic acid, which I'm a little under right now, so I got some from the stock room just enough to get up to 200 milligrams. I'll add that to a 5 milliliter conical vial with a large spin vein. Then I'll add 500 microliters of the acetic anhydride and two drops of 85% phosphoric acid. I'll set up the apparatus, attaching an air condenser and placing the conical vial in a hot water bath and I'll stir the solution until the salicylic acid is completely dissolved and I'll also monitor the temperature to make sure that it stays between 50 and 60 degrees Celsius. Once the solid is fully dissolved, the 15 minute reaction time can now be started. After those 15 minutes, I'll take the apparatus out of the hot water bath and get 1.4 milliliters of cold water to add into that solution and this will react with any excess acetic anhydride left over, which will form acetic acid, so this will smell like vinegar while the reaction is taking place. I'll let this react at room temperature for one to two minutes, and then place the conical vial into an ice bath to help the aspirin product come out of solution. Then I'll run that solution through the Hirsch funnel, rinsing the conical vial with some more cold water, as well as the spin vein, 
and all of the crude product left on the Hirsch funnel. I'll stir the aspirin around, letting the water filter through until the solid is nice and dry. Then I can take it out and transfer it over to a Craig tube where it'll be then recrystallized in ethanol. But before adding all of it, I'll set aside about 10 milligrams of that crude product so I can show how recrystallization will affect the melting point. I'll place the Craig tube into the hot water bath and get some 95% ethanol to begin dissolving the aspirin product. And I'll add that slowly with some stirring just up until the aspirin is fully dissolved. Once it has been dissolved, I can now test that the product will come out of solution in an ice bath. And it did come out at a decent rate in the ice. So I'll go ahead and place it back into the hot water bath to redissolve the solid completely. And now let it recrystallize slowly at room temperature. Once that's done, I can separate the crystals from the solution using a stopper and a propylene test tube and I'll place it in the centrifuge for a couple of minutes. I'll weigh out an empty watch glass again. Then I'll add the aspirin crystals and weigh out the full watch glass. I'll measure the melting point range for the pure recrystallized aspirin, which started showing droplets around 134.5 degrees Celsius and looked like it finished melting completely around 136.3 degrees Celsius. Once that's done, I'll also measure the melting point range for the crude aspirin. And this one started melting around 131.8 degrees Celsius and finished around 134.2. So definitely lower than the recrystallized product. And finally, I'll run an IR spec for the aspirin using the neutral mold technique. And it looks pretty good. We can see the carboxylic acid funnel two carbonyl peaks around 1690 and 1754 for both the carboxylic acid and the ester and we also have some carbon oxygen stretches between 1180 and 1300 for the ester as well. Okay, I wanted to go over leaning real quick on NMR and this example was just taken directly from the post-op questions. Let's look at hydrogens B and C, which are both doublets and are coupled to each other since they are neighboring hydrogens. Usually when we think of doublets, we kind of assume that the two peaks making up that doublet are symmetric or close to it, but that's actually not the case. For example, if we take a look at the doublet produced by hydrogen B, we can see that the peak closer to the signal coming from the hydrogen that is splitting it, in this case hydrogen C, is taller than the peak that is further away from hydrogen C. And we call this leaning because if we draw a line from the top of one peak of the doublet to the other, we could say that it is leaning towards the signal coming from the hydrogen that is splitting it. And we could do the same thing for hydrogen C, showing that it is leaning towards the signal produced by hydrogen B. Now we can look at the leaning in the NMRs for all the three compounds in the aspirin lab, but I'll just be focusing on this one. If we look at the HNMR, we can see a singlet around 4 ppm's with a pretty large integration and it's right in the chemical shift range for this kind of proton. So this NMR has to be for methyl salicylate because it is the only one that has a proton within that range, which would be hydrogen A. From here though, I'm only going to be focusing on the aromatic hydrogens because they are the only ones that would have any splitting. So let's take a look at the zoom in section where we can see the splitting a little bit better. And before we start analyzing any peaks, let's recognize that the carbonyl group will act as an electron withdrawing group, placing partial positive charges here. And the OH group will act as an electron donating group, placing partial negative charges here. Now, if we look at this doublet, we can recognize that it has to be coming from either hydrogen B or E, since they are the only ones that only have one neighbor. And since hydrogen B is attached to a carbon with a partial positive charge, it would be more de-shielded than hydrogen E, 
So this doublet has to be coming from hydrogen B. Then we can look at this triplet and recognize that it has to be coming from either hydrogen C or D. And again, since hydrogen D is attached to a carbon that has a partial positive, it would be more deshielded, so this signal would be for hydrogen D. Meaning that the remaining doublet would be for hydrogen E, and the remaining triplet would be for hydrogen C. Don't forget to label this little singlet here, which is right around 7.3, so this would be for the solvent used, in this case, CHCl3. Now that we have all of those peaks labeled, we can start considering leaning. So let's take a look at hydrogen B. It's coupled to hydrogen C, so its signal should be leaning towards the signal produced by hydrogen C. And if we draw a line from the top of the outer peak to the inner peak, it's clear that it is leaning towards hydrogen C. Now let's take a look at hydrogen D. It's coupled to both hydrogen C and E, so its signal should be leaning towards both of theirs. And if we draw a line from the top of the outer peak to the top of the inner one, it's clear that it's leaning towards them as well. With triplets, the middle peak is always going to be taller than the two outer ones. So when considering lean, you have to look at the tops of the two outer peaks instead of the middle one. So this is just another tool to help label and confirm peaks, but I'll leave the rest up to you now.